Before we get into the message, we wanted to say a special hello to our extended family around the world and also say thank you for joining us. Whether you're watching from our River of Life app, Facebook, or YouTube channels, we are so thankful to be connected with you. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God tonight. Isn't he worthy of praise tonight? Give glory in the house of God tonight. He is worthy of our praise tonight. He is worthy of our praise tonight. Glory, 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 glory. He is such a mighty good God. You know, when I go into large state prisons and we have this many women in attendance that days and months before pray to get in a service where they can hear the Word of God. I find myself when I go in those prisons, before we do anything else, I always tell them, we must give a standing ovation to the King of kings and the Lord of lords tonight. We must give him praise for all that he has done in our lives. We must honor him tonight. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Slap your neighbor, say, great woman of God, he is worthy to be praised. <laughs> Go on the other side, slap somebody else, say, he's worthy to be praised. <laughs> Hallelujah, you may be seated. Now look at your neighbor and say, beautiful woman of God. Let's hear some word tonight. One of the greatest things that we can ever do as the people of God is to give honor to every generation. The word of God is clear that we serve a God of many generations and all the generations. We serve the God of Abraham. We serve the God of Isaac, and we serve the God of Jacob. I love the 100th Psalm in the fifth verse where it distinctly says, For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness is to all generations. God isn't just about one generation. He is about all the generations. I don't know how many mamas need to hear that tonight, but God is about your children's generation. God is about your grandchildren's generation. He is the God of every generation, whether your child is in prison, whether your child is in rebellion, whether your child has forgotten the God that you raised them to serve. He is the God of their generation. Don't be down tonight. He's got your babies. That's not even on my notes. But I feel a need to tell some mamas tonight. He's got your babies in the palm of his hand. They may be running, but he's the God of their generation. They may not act like they know him, but he's the God of their generation. He's got your babies. It is indeed an honor to stand in this pulpit tonight of two highly anointed generals of the faith. Pastor Miriam, I have the highest honor of love and admiration for you. The humility that you operate in is so beautiful to see. And how you and Pastor Chris tend to the people that God has assigned to you is a model that all leaders can follow. And when I was meditating on just getting to know you and 
how it's so beautiful to see your love for Jesus. I heard as clear as a bell the Lord say to tell you, many daughters have done virtuously, but you excel us them all. So tonight, let us live out Romans 13, 7, that says we must give honor where honor is due. And let us stand to our feet and honor the generals of River of Life tonight and give them honor. I'm so excited to have my first lady here tonight who is very humble. She's on this first row. Stand up, please. First lady, Gwen Bullard of our church. We love you. We honor you. <laughs> Generations is such a powerful theme for Mother's Day weekend. As mothers and spiritual mothers, there is nothing more than we want to pour into the next generations and the generations that follow us. But we must always remember every day of our lives, we must remember as great women of God that what we're going through and what we're doing is in fact about the next generation. We must understand that our God thinks generationally. You must understand the battles that you're facing right now are not about you. The battles that you're facing right now is so that you can have victory over those battles and your children will not have to have those battles and your grandchildren will not have to have those battles. You are not fighting for yourself. You are fighting so the generations that follow you can go higher and higher in the Holy Spirit and serve God at a higher level and do what God has called us to do as women of God. And I decree and declare into you that those of you that have come into this place weary tonight, that when you leave, you will be charged by the Holy Spirit. And those of you with things on you that need to be broken, God is going to break them tonight. You are going to have miracle after miracle after miracle tonight. Tonight, as we look at what he has sent us to preach tonight, his presence is here. His anointing is here. I don't know what you have need of, but God sees what you need. As I sought the Lord diligently, what he would have me come and bring you tonight. I started researching in the scriptures and looking to see what woman could be such a beautiful role model to us as women in this century. What woman poured into the next generation explicitly within the scriptures? And I started looking at Eve, and then I looked at Sarah. I looked at Deborah, I looked at Mary Magdalene, and I said, Lord, please help me. I am looking for a woman to bring and preach. I know that you have something huge for the women that are going to be gathered and the women that are joining us online tonight. And I started searching, and of course, I found Naomi and Ruth. But I knew that Ariana had preached Ruth so powerfully. I watched her preach under the anointing. I found myself in my pajamas, sitting in my den, thinking I was just going to relax, you know, and watch a lot, just sit and watch this preaching. And before I knew it, I was jumping up. All right now, girl, you better preach. You better bring it. I was so excited, and I thank God for that sermon and the sermon Pastor Miriam gave. I so rejoiced, and I said, Lord, show me what to preach generationally. I was sitting on my bed, and 
I had Bibles everywhere the way I do when I study. My husband comes in at night, my big daddy that I love. Don't get me going about the big daddy now. <laughs> my six foot six hunk of burning love Jesus sent to me. <laughs> but he put a beautiful office in my house. And this week he was saying, baby, when are you going to use that office? I mean, it's gorgeous. And I said, I don't know when I'm with the Lord about what to preach. This is my sanctuary. And so I was sitting on the bed and I said, Lord, show me what to preach. And he spoke very, very beautifully to me. And he said, daughter, if there had not been a Rahab, there would not have been a Ruth. I said, praise God. I jumped up out of the bedroom, ran into the den. Dave was watching something on YouTube. You know how people in their late 50s with YouTube, it's like a new world. And I said, Dave, God gave me the sermon. He said, praise Bob, baby. I said, but you don't understand how long I've sought him for this. It's huge. If there had not been a way, there would have never been a roof. I am so excited what he has showed me to bring tonight. And I want you to stand to your feet to honor the most powerful force in the universe. I'm old school. I want you to stand to honor the word of God tonight. <laughs> Hebrews 11.3 says that the worlds were framed through this word of God. So you can open your iPads. I'm going to hit the generations now. You can open your iPads, your iPhones, your Androids, your Samsungs, whatever you have the Bible on tonight. You can even go old school and open your Bible with me tonight. And we are going to read about the greatest generational chain breaker of the Old Testament. Joshua chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Achaia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and they came to the house of a harlot named Rahab, and they lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut, when it was dark, that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan, to the fords, and as soon as those who had pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea, for when you came out of Egypt and you, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Shihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our heart melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above, and he is God of the earth. You may be seated. Generational chain breaker. Let me make loud and clear tonight that no one just happens to become a harlot. 
A woman does not just decide to become a prostitute and live her life being sexually abused night after night after night. No one just decides to be placed in prison and to be moved away from her children for years. No one just decides to become an alcoholic like we saw tonight with the mother and daughter. I was amazed when recently I went into before COVID and I was speaking with a warden of the largest prison in North Carolina that holds 1,700 women inmates. She called me in her office and she always called me Rev. She said, Rev, I've learned something today. We have a grandmother here who has a daughter here and there's granddaughter, there's a granddaughter here. Three generations of women put behind prison walls. Let me tell you this. That doesn't just happen. The enemy is clear in wanting to destroy every woman that has been placed on planet Earth. The enemy is clear that we as women have to wake up in areas of our lives and we have to realize that one behavior from one generation goes to the next generation. We must understand that there are territorial demonic forces that go from one generation to the next generation. We must understand as the women of God that it has to stop somewhere. It has to stop. Just like these three generations of women being locked up away from their families, we see Rahab who was locked up in Jericho. You know, I'm amazed at studying Rahab because I'm going to tell you I've met some Rahabs in prison. Don't be moved by where somebody is when God has a special place he's taken them to. Don't look at their present circumstances and think God can't break them out of that and use them in ways that you cannot imagine. Do not judge the next generation or anybody you see because you don't know what's been handed to them. You don't know what was given to them. Rahab did not choose to be a harlot. I can assure you it was handed down to her. Go with me with Rahab. When I study the scriptures, I put myself there. I'm actually in Jericho. And I am feeling what Rahab is feeling. I am in her house during a Locked night when the city is on high alert because the Israelite army is on the other side of the Jordan and they know they are next. And go with me there. And we see Rahab. Rahab knew how to hide those men that knocked on her door that night. I can imagine Rahab when she opened that door that night and she was very used to men coming in to her at the middle of the night or at the darkness. And I'm sure the Israelite men were very cloaked and their heads were down and she opened the door and and she said to them, come on in. And then she realized who they were. I love that Rahab knew how to hide Righteous men. But you got to understand, she had hidden a lot of unrighteous men. And what is God saying to us tonight as women of God? Women of God that truly wants to be the greatest chain breaker in your generation from way back. She hid men. What have we been hiding in our homes? As women of God, what are we hiding that we don't want anybody else to know about? 
What are we hiding? Are we hiding pain from a childhood that we have never dealt with and we don't want to deal with? And every time the pastors could make an altar call, you feel the Holy Spirit tugging at you, but yet you're like, no, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want anybody else to know that. Are we hiding the rejection that we have suffered at the hands of generations before us? Are we hiding low self-esteem? Come on now, I know I'm preaching to the right crowd tonight. What are we hiding? Are we hiding addictions? Are we hiding negativity that every time we walk in a church and somebody says, how are you doing? Praise the Lord, I'm doing amazing. And you just walked out the worst case of depression. You just looked in the mirror and thought, I am the worst person. What are we hiding? What are we hiding in our past? What are we hiding in our marriage that we need to bring to Jesus Christ and tonight we need to lay on this altar? What are we hiding our children are going through? I know I'm not the only woman that's had teenage rebellion. I know I'm not the only woman that's had 20-year-old rebellion. Who in the house am I preaching to that you are ready to see your children walk in what God has asked them to walk in and do what they were created to do? The church was created for the sick, for the wounded, for the weary. And we as women of God have got to stop hiding. I remember when the Lord was dealing with me about my son when he was in rebellion. Acting like he was raised by anybody but Jennifer and Dave Costell. Saying stuff he never had heard in our home. Can I get a witness? I'm sure everybody else has absolute angels they've raised. You know what I'm saying? And I remember at church one Sunday, I remember I was hurting so bad. But there I was, an elder in the church, sitting there trying to keep myself together. And when they had the altar call, the Holy Spirit said, get up there. You don't need to be praying for nobody else today. You need to get on the altar yourself. You need to cry out to God. Quit hiding your pain. God is going to give you breakthrough like you've never seen if you will quit hiding things. And I tell you tonight, that boy is walking with Jesus right now. Can I get a witness? And I believe without a doubt it's because I stopped hiding. Look at your neighbor, say, stop hiding your issues. Look on the other side, say, stop hiding your battles. I'm going to say it to you again. The battles that you're fighting right now is so the next generation will not have to fight them. Your children raising their children won't have their children go in rebellion because you've already been there. Can I get a witness? You have fought the battle. I love that Rahab uncovered what she was hiding. I love that when the king sent his men and said, two men have come in your house. Can you imagine what she was feeling? To hide an Israelite spy, they would take her life immediately. But the sister knew how to tell a lie. Now, I know that's none of y'all. Can I get a witness? <laughs> you pulled up in the driveway with enough of Dillard's up in your back seat. <laughs> and you run in the house real quick, and oops, there he is, home early from work. <laughs> Honey, what you been doing? Just laying before the Lord, just laying before the Lord. <laughs> Visiting the sick, praying for everybody thinking, Lord, have mercy, I got to get all these shoes in the trunk before he realized I was not laying before the Lord, but I was praying when I was up in the shoe aisle, let them have a size nine, God, let them have a size nine. That is one lie that is okay in the Bible that Rahab did. Not us. We can't be lying. Can I get a witness? I remember when the Lord said, confess. I said, confess what? 
confess about all the clothes in the trunk. You've been waiting for him to go to bed tonight to put away. I'm still trying to get there. Can I get a witness tonight? I lied to myself. I said, I don't want to bother his sleep tonight. You know what I mean? He needs to sleep peacefully. But I love how Rahab went up on that roof. That sister let them spies know they had come to the right house. Can you imagine the two spies when they had got into Jericho and they're looking for somewhere to go and the Holy Spirit sent them to a harlot's house. Can you imagine what they were thinking? Lord, this can this really be you once they realized who she was? And when Rahab went up on that rooftop and she uncovered those men of God, she told them all about their God. She said, I know that the Lord has given you the land. I know the God that you serve. He spread the Red Sea wide open, let you go on dry ground, and, just, and absolutely destroyed Pharaoh and the Egyptian army. What does that say to me, that they understood what had happened over 40 years earlier? What does that say? Some of us in this house tonight, the generations before us, did not take out the things that should have been taken out. But God has sent me tonight to tell you, God is pleased with you. He hears your prayers. And you they may not have been able to take that out in the former generation, but God says you are a generational chain breaker. You will do what you've been created to do. You shall, shall see your family set free. I love how... She reminded them how they had taken out the kings on the other side of the Jordan, the two kings of the Amorites. And there in verse 11, and you can go read that at home later and meditate on what I'm sharing with you. There in verse 11, she said what theologians said she could only say if she knew God herself. She said, for the Lord your God, he is God. He is the God in heaven and he is the God on earth. And that Lord God is Yahweh. And you cannot use the name of Yahweh if you don't know Yahweh. So she was telling those boys that night that thought they were all that in a bag of chips. She said, let me tell you something. Your God is well able to take this city. Your God took down Pharaoh. Your God took those kings on the other side. Your God can do anything he needs you to do. What is that saying to us when we're ready to step at that level as a chain breaker. I don't know what you're facing tonight, but God is saying your God is well able to do it. There is nothing impossible with your God. If you're facing cancer, my God has healed me twice of breast cancer, and I'm on this stage cancer-free tonight. If you have abuse in your background, I was sexually molested. At age nine, I was thrown in a lake to be dead by a pedophile, but my God said, that's going to be the one I use, because when I hear her, she will give me the glory. See, Rahab knew Yahweh. And I love that she reminds us as those spies talked to her. And they told her, they said, you need to do this. Don't tell our business. I bet she said, honey, if I was going to tell your business, it would have been down there with the king's men. <laughs> and they said, take this scarlet robe, robe. Put it on the outside of your window. And she said something so powerfully. She said, I will do according to your words. Reminded me of Mary, the mother of Jesus, when she looked at Gabriel and she said, I will do according to your words. As women of God, there are two things that we must do if we want to be a chain breaker in our generation. We must be women of the word. We have to know the word. We have to say the word. We have to apply the word. We have to truly be women of the word. Look at the woman next to you say, you better become a word woman. I see thousands of women inmates 
in prison. These women are so hungry for the Word of God. They understand that if they don't get the Word of God, then they're not going to break the chains that put them in those prison walls. And 95% of women inmates are coming out within three to four years. And while they are there, they become word women. We send out thousands of my Bible studies. My life story goes in those prisons by the thousands. And these women write testimony after testimony after testimony of what God has done for them. And I was so shocked about 15 years ago when I went into the first prison. I was used to church. I'm going to be honest. I didn't know what I was going into. And I would start a verse. I would say in Luke 137 says, and they would holler out, there is nothing impossible with my God. Never happened in a church. I would say Genesis 18, 14, there is nothing too hard for my God. They had already said it before I got it out. I start Jeremiah 32, 27, that says there is nothing too hard for my God. And they are literally speaking that word back at me at a level I was shocked. They had memorized the scriptures in the Bible study. They come up to me with my Bible studies that our partners buy for them, and they're falling apart, and they say, this is setting me free. I've got my children back. I have them right in me now. I'm believing for a miracle. They're standing. They're chain breakers. I've seen women get set free that shouldn't be getting set free. Release dates completely change because they said, God, let it be unto me according to your word. Let it be unto me according to your word. You got to be a word woman. You got to know the word. You got to breathe the word. You got to have word up on your mirror in the morning. You got to have word up in your car. You got to have word posted where you can post it, where it becomes a part of who you were. Rahab took those words and took them unto herself, what they told her to do. And the second thing she did, she put that scarlet rope outside of her window. I love how it, she put it on the outside of her house because her house was on the wall. And little did she know, because she didn't know the plan of the Israelites, but as those Israelites were going to be marching around that wall, they could look up there and say, there's the house of Rahab. She's going to be coming out with us according to what Joshua said. And as women of God, you've got to plead the blood of Jesus over your children, over your marriage, over your grandchildren, over your future children. Come on now. Over your future great, 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 great grandchildren. You must plead the blood of Jesus. And when the enemy is attacking, believe me, he's looking on the outside as he's going through the neighborhood and he's saying, we can't mess with that. I see the blood. We can't come up in there. I see the blood. We won't be able to mess that marriage up. I see the blood. I was so shocked the first time I went into a prison. I will never forget it. As I was going through gate after gate after gate, and I'm going deep into that prison, and I'm walking with a chaplain, and I have a team member, and I remember feeling such an anointing on me. I was shocked. And then I heard the demonic start screaming. Get her out of here. Get her out of here. And all of a sudden, one of the demons said, we can't touch her. She's covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. As women of God, to be generational chain breakers, we got to use the word like a sword and break every devil off with the word of God. And then we've got to plead the blood of Jesus against every lie that the enemy is telling us. Can you imagine Rahab 
She had gathered her mother and father, her brothers and her sisters. Wow, does that represent forgiveness. Theologians say her house was on the wall because she was on the outskirts of society. She had a small house. She was not a businesswoman. I've researched her through the best theologians that give comments for over the last two weeks. Rahab, a woman of the night that chose Yahweh. You can believe that those two spies came and knocked on her door. There hadn't been men there for a while. Because she knew Yahweh. Remember that in verse 11. Joshua 2, 11. So when she went to gather her mother and her father, because Jericho was terrified. Jericho was scared. They knew the Israelite army did not lose because of their God. I'm going to say that again. The enemy knows that when a woman of God understands her power with the Word of God and applying the blood of Jesus on our lives, on our marriages, on our children, on our grandchildren, on our checkbooks, on our tithing checks. Come on now. When we apply the blood of Jesus and put the Word of God on it, we don't lose. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says that my God always leads us into victory. I don't know what you're battling tonight, but according to the word of God, you are a winner. Tell your neighbor, say, you a winner, girl, if you know the Lord. Say it on the other side. You a winner if you know the Lord. And you got his word on it. I love that Rahab had gathered her family, and all of a sudden, she saw that Israelite army marching around those walls. I bet people in Jericho were running scared. They knew it was over. But Rahab had her family safe inside of her house. And what did the spies, the men of God, tell her? They said, keep your family in this house because when we come in this city, if they get out of this house, then they are going to go down. What does that say to us as women of God? We have entered a time where play day is over in this world right now. And I decree and declare to you, get your family family in a church house. Come on, let's be real here. It is time that you must take your family and you must say to them, you've got to come to the covering of a church right now. You better get up under a covering of the word of God. You better get up under the covering of some apostles. You better get up under the covering of some real pastors. You better get your family inside the house, Rahab's, because things are going down. And if you're not under a a covering, then you will not be protected. I will never forget, and people have laughed at me about this, but when my son was in college, acting like he wasn't raised up in my house, can I get a witness here? One time I heard him talking with a friend, and I, I went in his room, and I said, who raised you, honey? What do you mean, Mom? I said, who in the world raised you? I've never even heard some of them words, honey. We don't talk like that. I said, we got church tomorrow night. I said, and I'll pay you $100 to go with me. He said, say what? I said, 100 honey, a Benjamin, a Benjamin. I said, you in college, you po. You know what I mean? You po, honey. You don't have no money. And mama's got a Benjamin just sit up in church. Come on now. Well, I'll go. Where are we supposed to go? I said, all right, let's go. Why was I that way? Because I understand Isaiah 10, 27. You can sit under the anointing and whether you know it or not, it's affecting your life. 
You can come into a service like this tonight and you don't even have any realization what is being cut off of you under the anointing of the living God in a house like this. And little by little by little, I saw my son cry under the anointing, just sitting there. Yeah, it took a lot of money. I could have paid his tuition. No, I'm kidding. But I'm telling you, the anointing works. I love the story in 1 Kings where the Israelites were burying a man. And he was dead as dead could be. And all of a sudden, they saw the Syrian raiders. And they took that man. And they didn't have time to bury him, but he was dead. He didn't, he wasn't able to say a prayer. And they took that dead man and they threw him in a cave. And they took off and they're trying to outrun the Syrian raiders. And all of a sudden they look back and the man that had been dead was running with them too. Because they threw that man's body into the cave that had Elisha's bones. You just take what you need tonight. You don't just, you got to trust God with the anointing tonight. The anointing can raise the dead. Bring in a dead child in here spiritually and see if the anointing of God won't raise them up in a way you cannot imagine. The anointing of God. I love how Rahab was sitting in that house with her family. And she looked outside and she saw them going one time around for six days. One time around and she noticed they had a box that was gold with angels. And she said, that's got to be Yahweh with them. I know that Jericho's going down. But me and my family won't be going down because I serve him. And they did once around the first day, the second day, the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And then the seventh day, they kept marching, but they didn't say a word. They didn't open their mouths because Joshua had told them, do not say anything until I tell you to shout. See, you must understand when you are believing for the biggest battle in your life and you are believing for walls to come down in your life, you must understand there are times for you to be quiet if you're not going to be saying the word of God when that child comes home and you smell reefer on him. Come on, I'm getting real with you now. Or you see they've been drinking as a woman of God. You put a Bible up under their mattress. You slap some anointing on all on them when they wake up. You believe God and you decree and declare what God has spoken to you about your child. Don't you tell them he's sorry. Don't you tell them he's never going to make it. You remind them who he is because you are a woman of God. And there Rahab was. And that seventh time around, I bet she was so excited. And then all of a sudden, she felt those walls begin to shake. There she was knowing that Yahweh was going to take that city and the power of God was so powerful that it was shaking walls that four chariots could line up side by side in a city that theologians said is the oldest city in the world was Jericho. And she looked. And she's told her family, don't you leave. Don't you leave this house. Whatever you do, don't you leave this house. I don't know about what's shaking your family right now. I don't know what's shaking your life right now. But you've got to understand when you are a generational chain breaker that you stand no matter what, that you stay under the safety of the house of God you worship in. You stay under the safety of the word of God. You stay under the safety as you plead the blood of Jesus. And Rahab was there and she saw them marching and marching and marching. And then she started feeling the walls go down. And the people hollering as the Israelite army was breaking into Jericho. Her family, her families get destroyed. 
they heard the cries of the people. And that's when I bet she positioned herself at the door. And she said, I don't care what you hear going on out here. Don't you leave this house because this house is covered by the blood of Jesus. I don't know what you're hearing, but I decree and declare we shall be saved. And these walls may fall, but my house isn't going down because my house has got a covenant with God. My house has got a scarlet rope hanging outside the window. Stay in my house. And all of a sudden, can you imagine being God quiet? And Rahab heard that knock. Can you imagine when she said to her mama and her daddy and her sisters and her brothers, she said, we made it. <laughs> we made it. And all of a sudden, a harlot in a city that was on the outskirts, a harlot that had been used and abused, a harlot that people couldn't stand. That harlot was led out of a destroyed city by those two spies and by the Israelite army that had come to take out this great woman of God. Can you imagine when she stepped outside the door and looked around? In my mind, I've been there. I've been there when Jesus Christ set me free. I know what Rahab felt like when she had to step over the doorstep of the man that had abused her all of her life. I know what she felt like when she had to step over this one that said, you're never going to make it. You're nothing but a whore. She had to step over here of a childhood that she never thought she was good enough to do anything. She had to step over here over the sister that said, baby, you'll never make it. you nothing but trash. And she had to step over this one. And she said, except over that one. And she kept going. And she said, come on, family. All the enemies are dead. Come on, family. My God has made it. Come Come on, family. My God is able. Don't you give up on God. I don't know what you got to step over tonight. I don't know what addiction you got to get over tonight under the anointing. I don't know what poverty you got to get over tonight. I don't know what your mindset is sometimes, but you are a generational chain breaker. You are a woman of God, and God is able to bring you out. Every time I go in those prisons, then I stand before generations of women knowing what the enemy has done to them. I always tell them, my God is able. He healed my mind of years of sexual abuse. He delivered me from so many demonic powers. I quit counting when the delivered session was taking place. All my childhood had been spent with men using me and telling me I would never be anything. I can stand before any woman and say, don't you ever give up. God can set you free. He can set your child free. He can set your marriage free. He can give you your life back. Because he is the great I am. And sometimes in your mind, you just might have to step over it and tell the enemy, you're gone and you won't ever affect me again. And I love how every time you hear about Rahab, they got the harlot after her. Don't let anybody get on you about your past. Because, honey, your past is a testimony of the great I am in his power of what he can do for you. Rahab, the generational chain breaker. When she stepped out of that house, she went from a chain breaker to a chain blesser. She understood if God could break those chains, then God could bless everybody that got around her. She understands she had an anointing like nobody else. 
What should have taken her out caused her to be named in Hebrews 11 as a great woman of faith. What should have taken your mind, you sit here sound tonight, to give praise to God that you know that he is the great I am. And there was Rahab. And I love that Rahab married the prince of Judah. Come on now, I don't know about you. But we got the real pretty woman saga, and it's sanctified, honey. Can I get a witness here? Rahab married the prince of Judah. And I'm from the country, so I say salmon. But my husband's from the north, so he may say salmon. Can I get a witness here? I forgot to look it up in the Hebrew how you said that. So we just going to call him Brother Salmon. You know what I mean tonight? So Rahab. Married the prince of Judah. And Rahab became a chain blesser. Look at your neighbor say, you buy a chain blesser, honey. Look on the other side say, you, you next to a great woman of God that I bless you with my words. Can you imagine those women of Israel? There was the prince of Judah. You know what I'm talking about here. The brother that was beautiful and had money. Can you hear him? You know what I mean here. Did you hear that Salmon's finally marrying? I heard that. Who is he marrying? A princess? He's marrying Rahab, the harlot. But I met the sister, honey, and she's so anointed. I'm not putting my mouth on her. Y'all better leave that woman alone. You better leave her alone. She carries an anointing. I'm telling you, I rejoice for Brother Sam. I've been trying to get him for 15 years, but I rejoice he's getting married. You know what I mean? But Salmon and Rahab had a son. You can look it up in Matthew chapter 1. Named Boaz. Come on now, Boaz, 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 Boaz. All the single women trying to wait on that Boaz, Boaz, Boaz. But you can't get past Rahab, Rahab, Rahab if you don't really know the Lord. Can I get a witness here? So she raised Boaz. And Rahab was the first non-Israelite woman, the first Gentile to come into the kingdom of God. Some of you wondering why you've had so many battles. It's because the anointing so great that's going to hit your life. Some of you wondered why you had to fight so hard, why you didn't come out of a lineage that was godly. Some of you wonder, why am I always fighting? You fighting, baby, because you're so anointed. Can I get a witness here? Mm, I felt that myself. You know what I mean? Woo, thank you, God. Obed had a little baby boy named Jesse. You fighting for your future generations. Jesse had eight sons, and the youngest son was named David. That took that giant down. Can I get a witness? So King David, the greatest king in Israel, came up out of Boaz's fight. I mean, uh, Rahab's fight in Jericho. You got to understand your fight is so big because of the generations behind you. You got kings in your loins. You got generations of prophets and priests. You got pastors. You got the men and women of God in your generations. Don't you quit your fight. God wants to give you a miracle. The fight is not about you. The fight is about your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, your great-great-grandchildren. 
Rahab was the great, great, great grandmother of King David. Do you understand why we must fight for the generations that are coming behind us? God has placed a special anointing tonight on this house. There has been a special anointing placed. I am going to give you a modern day Rahab. As the chaplain of Pender County Jail, I get to meet girls one-on-one. -on -one. I get to go into the girls' dorm, and I get to walk in the girls' dorm. And the Holy Spirit told me how to go in there because our words are powerful. Rahab invoked such a blessing on Boaz that went to Obed, that went to Jesse, that went to David, that went to Joseph, Mary, that was the stepfather of Jesus, that went to Jesus himself, the adopted father of Jesus. And I enter that girl's dorm in Pender County Jail or any prison I go into and I always say, hello, great women of God. And I will never forget the day that the Lord sent me into Pender County Jail and I'd heard there was a new girl in the dorm. And I heard she was one of the roughest girls that had ever hit that dorm. But see, that doesn't scare me. I know I carry the anointing. I know what God has delivered me from. So no matter what, I don't back down because resurrection power rests within me as a woman of God. So I went in that jail cell and the female dorm and I saw this girl and she was covered in sores because of the myth that she had used for years and years. And I remember I looked at her, and all I saw was pain. I remember saying, that baby has been so abused and used and forgotten, and here she is laying in this bed, and as I knelt down and I looked at her, I remember thinking, where is the life in her eyes? She has no life in her. Can you put this picture up? When I looked at her, I remember thinking, I am sitting beside a Rahab. And I said, baby, Jesus loves you. And little by little, she joined in on the devotions. And little by little, she wanted to hear about Jesus that had healed me of being sexually abused. Little by little, her story of being incestually raped by her state father over and over and her mother absolutely selling her for the drug habit that she had and seeing all this as a little girl. And she had become herself a Rahab before Christ. And I will never forget that Easter Sunday when the Holy Spirit said, present the gospel as you never presented it. And that day in the girls' dorm, every woman there accepted Jesus Christ. And I remember seeing this baby, life coming to her eyes. And she said to me, she said, Chaplain, can I come into the house of hope that you have? She said, I know I've got charges in two states and three counties and I have 11 felonies. And she said, but I don't know if God will do that for me. 
And I remember I said, baby, you've been bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 6, 20 says, you no longer your own, honey. You've accepted Jesus, and we serve the God of the impossible. And yes, I believe he's going to bring you to the house of hope. We saw miracle after miracle, and those 11 felonies were erased, and that sister ended up with two misdemeanors and came to the house of hope. She had lost her children, and God made a way to get her children back. We found out, me and my staff, that her children were in a foster situation and they were being abused by the man in the home. And I'm telling you, me and my staff went and rescued those children out of Charlotte, North Carolina and brought them knowing that my God is able. (laughs) Megan was supposed to be here tonight. But on the way here, she found out one of her babies had was sick and she had to go back home. But let me show you what God has done for Rahab tonight. There she is. There she is. My God can do anything. My God. Thank you, God. Thousands of women get healed because they dared to believe that Yahweh was who he said that he was. I present a serious call tonight. I want every eye closed in this place, every head bowed. There are some of you that have entered this house tonight and you are not sure of your salvation. You want to be the chain breaker in your family the way that I was the chain breaker, the way that Rahab was the chain breaker, the way that Megan was the chain breaker. And tonight, the Holy Spirit is saying to you that this is your night to come to Jesus, surrender it all to him. I always say I got saved a thousand times before I really got saved. I love this youth up here. Every head bowed and every eye closed right now. Nobody's going to embarrass you or have you stand up and give your name. But if you know that you know that you know that you are not born again, or you need to rededicate your life to Christ, I ask you to just slip your hand up and there isn't anybody watching. Just put your hand up. Amen. I see those hands. I see those hands. I see hands. I see your hands. Right now, by putting your hands up, you are saying, I want Jesus. I want the Lord in the balcony. Do we have any hands up? That tonight is your night where you say, I am going to be the generational chain breaker. I am going to step out in faith. I may be the first generation, just like Jennifer, that ever walked with the Lord. But I'm going to do that. Lord, you saw all those hands. And I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that they surrender at levels and feel your love as they have never felt it. I thank you that heaven is celebrating tonight because they have surrendered to you. They have said that we will serve all the days of our life now and trust you, God. I thank you that they will be generational blessers. And all the chains that they broke will not go forward to the next generation. And I praise you for that. 